Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who might be lost, you're wandering into a talk on hybrid clouds, uh, landmines, things that happen in the real world that cause problems with, uh, with building hybrid cloud applications. Um, so given that we uh, only have about 40 minutes and I tend to over talk, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, my name is Drew Smith. I am a cloud applications engineer with cloud scaling. Uh, cloud scaling, you've probably heard of before, but uh, if not, we build uh, a distribution of OpenStack. We are very much in, uh, an architecture company, which makes it a little bit weird that we have an applications engineer on staff, uh, given that we don't actually build any applications. But it's actually it's, it's a super exciting position for me, because what I end up doing is, um, is, is mostly exploring the different technologies and the different ways that people interact with OpenStack, and um, becoming sort of a subject matter expert for, uh, for, for the team so that we, we can guide the way that the development goes forward. Uh, I liken it to if you are a team full of plumbers, you should probably have somebody trained up as an electrician if you're going to go cutting into walls all the time. So yeah, cloud application engineer at cloud scaling. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, hybrid cloud architecture and problems that you come into it. Now, I see some of you guys are already pulling out your cameras. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, Slideshare.net slash drumulonimbus. That's that's cumulonimbus, like the clouds, only I'm Drew, so that's how it works. This is our, our, our story arc for the day. We're going to go through the what's and why's. We're going to go through uh, what enables hybrid clouds, um, understanding your application, uh, some usual approaches to hybrid clouds design, and um, then we're going to sort of dig into the, some of the landmines that you're going to actually, the, the stuff that you will probably run into, depending on the level of, um, of detail you go into with your hybrid cloud. So the big question, which we're not going to spend too much time on because we've already been through this all day, is what is hybrid cloud? And the real answer is it's different for everybody. Everyone has a, a different idea about it. And we, we agree. There's a lot of different things. Like it can, be, um, it can be your application tier in public cloud and maybe for PCI compliance or regulations, your data tier in, uh, in a private cloud. It could be a containerized app running in a couple of different environments. It could be... Um, Oh, geez, it could be uh, your app in one cloud and uh, a hot, cold failover in another cloud. There's all kinds of things you can be doing with hybrid cloud. But we have sort of agreed on a definition for this, um, that hybrid cloud is your apps leveraging the functional stack of multiple cloud infrastructures. And just an aside there, that's not an insult, the uh, hybrid cloud for, drum for dummies thing on the side. I, I went looking for, uh, for a good image for this, and uh, this is actually what came up when I searched for uh, hybrid cloud application design. Um, as a second aside, my uh, CEO, Randy Bias, is actually quoted in this book. So yeah, so anyway, uh, it's uh, <laughs> hybrid cloud is your apps leveraging the functional stack. So what's a functional stack? Um, a functional stack is a collection of services that make up a cloud environment. So you can think of it like, um, like the LAMP stack, for instance, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Now that stack, and we're going we're gonna to stay stack a lot here today, but that stack is, is something that really enabled an entire generation of web programmers to build applications that you know, took the web to web 2.0 and, uh, and really pushed forward the technology. So um, let's talk a little bit about that functional stack. Um, what we've identified is, is, is these things right here. This list of stuff we, are, are things that we feel are in any cloud-based application, right? anything that uses what we call um, cloud-native design. And that's design of applications that really uh, that, that are built to route around failure, like the, uh, the Netflix of the world, the, and Google, to a certain extent, on the hardware level kind of thing. So cloud-native design, you're basically addressing all of these points. So uh, remember that we said hybrid cloud is your, levs, your apps leveraging uh, the functional stack in multiple environments. Well, basically what that means is that uh, you're going to have to take, you're going to have to basically deal with every one of these things on one or more environments um, in order to get to a hybrid environment. So what does that really mean? And like I said, there's, there's a little bit too much uh, of the word stack around here. but. If you see here, I've drawn some red arrows between um, the hybrid, the functional stack and OpenStack and on, on AWS. So if, like, for instance, the orchestration layer on both sides. On uh, OpenStack, you have like heat. On the uh, AWS side, you'd have cloud formation. Um, on the data storage side, you'd have uh, um, Cinder and Swift. On the other side, you'd have um, uh, EBS volumes and S3 kind of thing. But the reality of this is those arrows don't really look as just straightforward as we all think. So um, 
it's not so much, building a hybrid uh, application isn't so much about just mapping one to one. Well, that's not true. It really is mapping one to one, but it's the mapping that's the details. So you're, it's, it's not so much uh, negotiation between the two, but your hybrid app design is figuring out exactly where the safe point is between those two functional stacks. So let's talk a little bit about what enables hybrid cloud. And this, this is a spectrum image that, uh, that one of our guys came up with. And it's labeled abstraction. So on, on one side of the abstraction spectrum, you have control. On the other end, you have ease of use. Now, where you personally fall on this, uh, in this spectrum is going to depend on a lot of things, uh, mostly your um, well, your level of, of comfort, for instance, and your level of technical prowess. And also, it's going to depend a little bit on uh, the tools that you've chosen. So the tools that you've chosen in advance uh, are going to de determine where you're going to fit on the level of abstraction. But also, it plays right back into itself in that if, you are, if you're uh, just coming into this early, where you are comfort-wise in the abstraction spectrum is going to determine what tools you actually choose to go forward. So. Um, so which one is the best for you? Well, the, the real answer is that depends. Every application, unfortunately, these days is a unique and beautiful snowflake. And we talk a lot about the idea of um, cattle versus pets, but that's on the infrastructure layer. And today we're talking more about applications, and those sit on top of the infrastructure. So yeah, basically, your route forward, picking your tools, figuring out where you're going, begins with understanding your application. And really, this is, uh, this is unique to everybody. You're going to have to put your time in here. Um, I would recommend even sitting down and starting off on paper with even such simple stuff like uh, a pros and cons list. But uh, some things to ask yourself before you actually head towards building a hybrid application are like, why are you going there in the first place? Like, what is it about your application that you feel uh, makes it suited to leveraging uh, resources in multiple environments? Um, what are your expectations? What do you think you're going to get back from having this application running in multiple places? Like, are you, if you're looking for, um, for I increased security or increased availability, uh, decreased cost, um, like what makes it, uh, what, what is leading you there in the first place and what do you hope to get back? And lastly, what are your likely bottlenecks? And this is, this is really basic. Actually, you know what I forgot to ask earlier on is uh, in the audience here, how many people are, well, how many people consider yourselves like application developers? Nice. How many uh, roughly infrastructure people? Way more. Cool. Uh, and how about um, people who find themselves sort of making decisions about technology but don't really count as the earlier two? Yep, so, okay, first and third are probably roughly equal and mostly infrastructure people. So that I, I really aims to have kind of um, information for all three tiers there, but um, uh, depending where you come from, this is, um, this is what Randy likes to call secret sauce. This is, um, this is a really great tip. If you haven't read this book yet, this will really help you to understand your, not only your environment, but um, your workflow. And uh, it's, it's really a book about DevOps and how DevOps moves forward. So once you've understood your application and you got everything written down and you're, uh, you know, you're ready to move forward stuff, uh, it's a good idea to determine really early like, what success looks like. Now, the reason for this is this technology has a tendency to move really fast and enable people in ways that it is kind of unprecedented. So if you start off your, um, if you start off your month saying, OK, our goals for the month are A, B, and C, and you've actually met that at the end of the first week, there's a tendency to add MNOP and XYZ onto your goals for the end of the month. And then by the end of the month, you've hit MNOP, but you haven't hit XYZ, and your boss is saying you've failed. So basically, success looks like roll, uh, writing everything down first and determining exactly what your, your, your goals are. So we like to think of it like this. So, Able to deploy an app into or across multiple environments with common operational tools or processes and consistent performance. Does that sound like success? Uh, pretty much. Now, the real question is, is that necessary? Do we really need to nail it quite that hard in order to call it success? So um, I consulted for a company a little while back who were doing a lot of uh, image processing. And they were doing it all on, on their own hardware. And it was basically a PHP application doing a lot of image magic stuff. So they were really CPU bound. Uh, in the end, the solution that they built that they were very happy with was um, bursting into the AWS cloud manually. So they kept, um, 
they kept a couple of machines. I'm going to simplify this a lot, but they kept a couple of uh, m1.small machines running full time in AWS. And one of them was a database. One of them was a uh, uh, PHP image processor unit. And when they needed to burst into it, they manually went into AWS and cloned the, the database and spun it up as, a, as an M3.xl, and then manually cloned the um, PHP machine and spun in 25 of those up as a C1.medium or something along those lines. And they had their cluster just manually built within about an hour. And that was, you know, that was good enough for them. That actually took away all of the workload that they were working on. That gave them the, the end result they were looking for, which was suddenly they had 10 times their capacity for two or three days, and then they could tear it all down again. Now, that counts in my mind as a hybrid application. But you know, they didn't need to really nail it to win. Now, on the other hand, what does failure look like? So <laughs> just to go off on a different story here, um, when I was in high school, I delivered pizzas for a living, and all the guys that were really getting laid were, um, were driving nice cars. They had, you know, their parents bought them Mustangs or something, and it's a very small town on the East Coast, and, you know, it's, it, it, everything gets around. But, uh, so I figured I needed to get a car, and I, I did my research, and I went out, and I found a farmer on New Brunswick's equivalent of Craigslist that was selling um, a 1974 Mercedes 280 SL for $3,500. And so I you know, bored my mom's Mercury Tracer and drove out to his farm, and he opened the barn, and there it was. And, but he looked me up and down, and he said, son, I won't sell you this car. And I just flustered, of course. And I said, what, what, why? He said, son, the most expensive Mercedes you can buy is a cheap Mercedes. I, you know, got really angry about that and basically stormed off and spent that $3,500 on a very fast 486 with 16 megabytes of RAM. And uh, still to this day, I've never actually owned a car. But I, <laughs> I do know what he was talking about now. Like, we've, we've probably all seen this. When we try to implement something that, you know, is supposed to save us time and actually ends up taking more time. Uh, so, you know, if it... If you implement a hybrid cloud environment and it actually introduces more complexity than you started with, you've probably failed. If you uh, implement it with the with the gain with the with the aims of having like um, better performance across it, so you can you know sp spread out and and have uh, have a, a net sum greater speed for your application, and the end result is actually a net slower application speed. Um, Randy talks about one uh, in his in his talk earlier today with uh, Korean Telecom where they. Uh, built an application in their uh, data center and with zero millisecond latency on the network, and then deployed it to, um, to data centers with 200 millisecond latency. And it turns out the application had uh, a lot more chattiness. Every API call was taking you know, 10 times longer. And the sum together was that each act action within that application was now taking 30 seconds. And they weren't very happy with this. So. Um, what about uh, if it takes workarounds or hacks? So we're going to talk a little bit in a bit about um, ways you can actually get to hybrid. But um, you know, if, if all of the, the places where you're doing scaling or talking to multiple clouds at once are, uh, for, are functionally a series of bash scripts, and every time there's a change to any one of your, uh, of your clouds, you have to go back in and rewrite your scripts and figure out what that change was and how to work around it, you're not winning. You know, so. All right, so let's talk about usual approaches. So we're back here to this um, uh, spectrum again. And we get your control and your ease of use. We're going to go through each of these three um, ways to approach hybrid cloud. We're going to start off with a DIY app management. And it's important to note that I'm not talking about DIY um, OpenStack here. I'm talking about DIY application management. So what does that look like? Um, well, if you've got a really great team, if you're extremely technical and you have a whole bunch of Python guys or a bunch of Ruby guys who just can speak to uh, APIs um, in their sleep, like that's that's a viable option. You know, you can you can absolutely script out your own stuff, and you know, with uh, Boto libs for uh, Python, actually, you know, spinning up machines in AWS is like God. It's it's like three lines of Python. It's nothing. So you know, doing it yourself. Not only is it easy, it's actually pretty fun for the right amount of, for the right guys. But okay, this is actually an aside, so my flow is a little broken. But um, so 
the problem here is uh, sometimes it use, uh, people tend to use images, like um, system images, AMIs, as a kind of change control. And that, uh, that's not a great idea. But we're going to get back to that in much greater detail in a little while. Uh, the other thing is, with, even if, if you're building your stuff um, completely from scratch in, in Python, even if you really know what you're doing, uh, often um, orchestration is going to be pretty tricky. Uh, you know, it, if, you're, if your libraries work really well on AWS, they probably work mostly well, which we'll talk about in a little while, on OpenStack. But you're going to have to figure out something else entirely for, uh, for Rackspace or for, uh, heaven forbid, Microsoft Azure, uh, et cetera. So it can be a little bit tricky. Um, on your second tier, you've got your pre-baked abstraction layers. Now, uh, if I'm being honest, this is actually what I find myself recommending to most people. Um, the more people ask me about this, the, the, the more I kind of go in this direction. So these are um, third-party applications that sort of run above the cloud and do all your orchestration and your image management and your metrics and your monitoring and everything for you. Um, but it comes at a little bit of a cost. Um, you know, there is less effort, but you also have a little bit less fine-grained control over everything that's happening. And if your team is a bunch of guys that compile their own kernel, then they're probably going to balk a little bit about this. You know, you can swing them over if you, you know, show them this is all the benefits of going in this route. But yeah, this, is a, this can be a little bit tricky to, to convince them. The other side is it's, it's a lot more expensive. Like if you're, uh, I mean, actually, Scalar has a, a nice free tier, which is, is very appreciated. But, uh, but you know, you can look at 30 to 50 percent more upfront costs on these things, and that's just running machines in the in in the um, in the public cloud. In the private cloud, you're used to those VMs already being paid for, but now you've got to you know send somebody a check at the end of mo end of the month to manage stuff that's on your own cloud, and that's kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of options, as you can see. We put a bunch of them up there. I uh, had a guy uh, talk to me in great detail about uh, Instratius uh, last night, and I'm, uh, I'm really interested. Now I've got to go home and dig into it. Uh, so on your third tier, you get your uh, platform as a service frameworks. And these are the cloud foundries and the open shifts. And these abstract way, way more. Oh, my build's broken. Uh, they, they basically give you the option of, of things like, rather than look at uh, a database as a, as a server unit, you can look at that database as, um, uh, as a service. You can just say, I need a database. I want to look at it at, at this endpoint, and I want to just run SQL queries at it. I don't want to worry about scaling. I don't want to worry about taking care of it. Go. And these things will take care of that kind of stuff for you. And they'll, they'll get you to where you want. But you have the least granularity and control compared to your like, DIY levels. And you're, you know, the more you build into this, the more you're locked in. And that's, that's kind of tricky. And of course, depending on which direction you go in this, I see uh, OpenShift also has a, um, a free tier. But it's, I guess, I'm guessing if you go really enterprise level with this kind of stuff, you're, you're going to look into a, a, a costly long-term contract. All right, well, we're going to jump into the landmine stuff. This is uh, kind of the bulk of our. Um, of, of the presentation, but uh, this is again just a, a sort of a table of contents. We're going to go through all these just really quickly. So, and if, if you missed it earlier, uh, all the slides are available online already at uh, slideshare.net slash drumulonimbus, um, and they'll be up at the end too. So, you know, don't worry about having to snap pictures every time. All right, um, there we go. So, what about uh, feature coverage and gaps? So, here we've got like what I'm talking about here is, is features that might exist on one cloud platform, but not necessarily on another. Um, so for instance, say, like, uh, say you've built an application that depends on um, Amazon's SQS service and uh, DynamoDB and Route 53. And now you're going to try to make that application go hybrid. You're going to have a really bad time here. You have, a, you have a lot of migration to do before you can get that to work in, in Google Cloud. Now, there are some features like, uh, that um, they've really made uh, a lot of effort to stay completely compatible, like um, uh, AWS's S3 service. To switch over from S3 to uh, the Google, Google Cloud platform is literally just changing the endpoint. And everything just works exactly as it, as it, as it should. Um, but for instance, has anybody here ever tried to uh, implement the uh, Netflix OSS suite on OpenStack? Nobody. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, that's a tricky one. I, I spent a couple of weeks trying, and there are a few applications. Even though some of them are written straight up in Java, uh, you can get them to run, but they had to write a lot of uh, underpinning stuff, and they, um, they use the, the AMI subsystem really heavily. They build their own AMIs. They have glue under there. It's, it, yeah, it's a tricky one to, uh, to get that running. They've, uh, they really did build into a couple of the uh, Amazon services deeper than I would have liked. But that being said, it's amazing software, and their team is just on top of stuff. So dependence on cloud-specific services. That's what I was just talking about. With the, um, if you depend on Route 53 or SQS for queuing or something like that, you're, you're going to have a rough time um, trying to get to a hybrid environment. Um, differences in cloud features is another thing that can affect that. So um, say, uh, OK, how about, uh, like, what is it called again? EBS volumes in, uh, in AWS. You know, you, can, you create a volume, you attach it to a server. Um, that works just great. But if you want to do that on a Google Cloud Platform, they call that persistent disks, or PD. And they work almost identically. Except there's a nice little trick that on um, Google, you can take one of those PD disks and attach it read-only to multiple instances, which I find extremely valuable. And really, when I started with AWS, that's what I kind of you know, assumed things would be how things would work. Um, it's only read-only, but if you've architected an application around that understanding that you can take um, a, you know, a persistent disk and attach it to multiple instances and read it back, uh, and then you try to move that over into AWS or OpenStack, you're, you're out of luck. That's just if they don't work the same way. Um, and lastly, even similar clouds might not have the same stuff uh, enabled. I know, uh, having dealt with a whole bunch of different OpenStack clouds in the last few years, that um, yeah, uh, even OpenStack clouds these days are pretty much snowflakes. Like You might have Solometer. You might not. You might have heat. Well, not without Solometer. Uh, you're basically. Even if they're the same technology, they might not have the same features. So that's a landmine that you're going to have to worry about. Behavioral compatibility is a different thing. Can this actually be read? Oh, nice. So um, the thing about behavioral compatibility is that application developers tend to look at whatever they're developing on as a reference architecture. And that doesn't smoothly flow into, uh, <laughs> into a public cloud. Um, it seems in, in some cases, and I talked to, uh, I believe it was Jamal from uh, NetApp this morning, uh, and, and he, his argument is very much that, uh, that Docker is the way to go here, that obviously if, if you can just put your application in a container, that's the answer, that's just run it, run it everywhere. But I argue back that, um, that Docker gives you uh, a, 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 a very common environment, but it doesn't give you a common architecture underneath, and that's really the headache there. And this, this comes back to the difference between, again, developers and and infrastructure people. And developers, like, as infrastructure people, how many times in the last couple of years have you heard, well, it, it ran in the dev network, or well, it runs on my desktop? It's, it, you know, this is a, a very common developer thing to think, OK, well, it, ru it runs in this little space, so therefore, just make that little space and make it public. And that's just not how things work in the real world. Um, so the image is about actually partially implemented or partially compatible APIs. and. Uh, the joke is that um, so the EC2, uh, AWS EC2 Compat API uh, will respond to requests for a list of volumes, but it won't respond to a list of volumes with a filter. So yeah. Uh, configuration differences between similar clouds. Uh, you can think of this like, um, say, say you have two OpenStack implementations, and one of them has, uh, has floating IP auto assignment turned on. So every time you bring up an instance, it automatically gets a floating IP and can talk to the net, and then it can talk to it. Uh, another almost identical OpenStack installation has that turned off. This is literally uh, uh, like a true or false in Nova Network config. But it, it just goes to show that like, if you're building an application that's going to fit onto one um, OpenStack cloud, that even if it has all the same components, one little switch in a, in a configuration file is going to make the difference that your application, if it's expecting to be able to talk to the internet when it gets up, if you try and drop it in the other cloud that doesn't give it a floating IP automatically, you're going to have to add that extra step to issue a floating IP. And that's just, maybe that's just an extra line in your script, or you know, maybe that's two days to figure out why you can't talk to these machines if, you're, uh, if your technical, problem, technical uh, team is too busy to dig into that kind of stuff. Uh, and the last one is variable performance from one cloud to another. And so 
now as we're getting to more and more uh, public clouds and uh, people are just deploying OpenStack willy-nilly and, and starting to sell it, uh, what do we know about what's going on under, underneath there? It's like, what, you know, does one cloud, is, is it being oversold? In certain sense, you know, it almost should be in some, it, it, for like a budget cloud. Like a, the hotel industry is known for years that you can, you can safely oversell 10% and people are not going to show up. And it rarely happens that you show up at a hotel. It's, a, it's super rare that you show up at a hotel and, it, the, and your room is gone. But the same thing happens with clouds. If you, you, know, you don't know what they've sold. You don't know who else is on the same network link as you. Maybe they're you know, uh, some sort of gossip site. Maybe they're getting a lot, a lot of traffic. That's a thing. All right, what about image management? And this is the one I was talking about a little earlier with the uh, AMIs. This, uh, <laughs> this is a really big mistake that a lot of people make, especially as they're starting out. Um, so the idea is, as you're building your first or second or even a bunch of ways in, uh, you have a tendency to take, a, take an, an AMI or a system image of Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever your preferred is and configure it. You know, set your, your, US, set your uh, SSH keys up, set your Etsy MOTD, configure postfix, get it up to you know, your specs, and then snapshot it and then call that the gold master and throw that on the image server. And that's really normal and really typical. Uh, the problem with that when you start to move into a hybrid cloud environment is that like even in AWS between availability zones, you have to copy that image to multiple places. Like you can't use the same image uh, in US East one and US West one. You have to actually copy it to the other end and it gets a new AMI ID. Now you're maintaining three. Um, once you bring up, say, 20 VMs with that image, now there's a patch that comes out. So you know it's, it's important, so you patch it all live, and, um, and you tell yourself, OK, well, I'll, I'll, I'll spin up an extra one, and I'll patch that, and I'll remake the new um, master. But because these are slightly configured differently with Chef or something, now you've got to back, pour it back out the Chef. Now you've got to put the, the new thing in and snapshot again. So yeah, uh, the problem with this is that uh, Staging and patching in multiple environments takes a hell of a lot of time, and it gets out of hand really quickly. Um, the more environments you add, the more images you're maintaining. So you know, the real trick here at the end of the day is, uh, is configuration management, is rather than look at um, image management as, uh, as, as, your, as your change control for your images, you know, start with an, an extremely stock, say, Ubuntu or Red Hat image, one that comes directly from them, and apply everything with change control. Use, uh, your, pick which one you want, Puppet or Chef or Salt or Ansible or CF Engine or whatever you like, and, and stick to it. Dig really hard into it. Um, it really does seem like it's the best way to do things when you're starting out. Just like make your own gold master. And yet, you know, uh, when I started out, man, I, I built all my AMIs literally from scratch. You know, you, you spin up an AMI and start installing a new version of the operating system into a temp directory. And then clone that out into S3 in buckets. And then pull that back down as an image. And yeah, so don't do that. <laughs> All right, so monitoring and autoscaling is a really tricky one, too. Um, lots of people don't actually draw the line between these two, but the, the trick here is that you can't have autoscaling without monitoring. Like, if you want to autoscale based on CPU use, how do you know what that CPU use is from a central location if you don't have monitoring? And so the problem here is that there's no one standard that goes between multiple clouds. Uh, so Amazon's got CloudWatch. Uh, OpenStack's got Solometer. Um, <laughs> Google's got a, a really weird lack right there, actually, that I don't quite um, uh, understand just yet. They have a, a reference model of uh, autoscaling that's a, that's a Java application that runs um, on Google App Engine. And then you have to run a, a little agent on each one of your VMs that listens and will like, report metrics as that Java app kind of connects to each one. But they don't have a single kind of, okay, this is the back end. This is how we talk to, um, uh, this is how we talk to all of our instances and, and, and report back. And that's, you know, that's, that's critical. That's, that's something that at every cloud is going to need, and it's all going to have to be reconciled back into one place if you want to auto scale between a bunch of places. Um, Here's where abstraction comes in, which works out really nicely. Uh, the right scales and scalers of the world, actually, they, they do have um, the same kind of thing, an agent that runs on, your, uh, that runs on each one of your VMs. But what they provide is, is um, 
uh, instances, sorry, images that are, that are pre-baked that already have all of their agents up and running. And those agents report back to their central kind of web uh, interface and show you all the metrics and also handle all the auto-scaling um, information that they need to, to, to spin up extra stuff. Um, yeah, if you're doing it yourself, though, you're on your own. You, there's, there's no one single way. Uh, Amazon has a really nice way of, of exposing uh, CloudWatch, and there's a patch in uh, GitHub that you can download that will uh, pull um, those CloudWatch things into uh, Nagios. Uh, or Sensu, uh, but really, it's, it's 2014. Do we really still need to use Nagios? Is that it? Anyway. <laughs> so security and access is a big one, um, and we're not just talking about um, like you know locking down the machines to uh, SSH keys, but we're talking about like a broader range of access here, like um, uh, security groups and access to resources and how each machine can actually can access uh, uh, like drive shares and network links. Uh, this is a really big thing. And there's no way to bridge it across clouds right now. Like, there is no single model of, uh, of security management that works across multiple environments. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, you know, maybe you could use some kind of LDAP plus Kerberos thing. But you know, uh, I'll see you in a year or two when you get it done, and we'll, we'll talk then. It's, it's a, a, an insane <laughs> headache unless you're really already good at Kerberos. Um, uh, Google has something really, really, like they've basically tied it right into uh, Google Apps for Business, which is really nice. Since that's actually a cloud scaling, one of the things that we're already doing for our internal office network is we've got a, a, a custom Radius uh, plugin that we uh, authenticate against, against Google so that we can authenticate internally against uh, different uh, resources in our labs. But I mean, even that's pretty hacky. Uh, it works, and it works great. But you know, what are you going to choose when it comes to uh, managing you know, access across multiple environments? Uh, one thing that, uh, that these abstraction layers do pretty well is key management. So they can, you, know, put the, you can declare user groups and such, and they'll put the appropriate SSH keys onto, onto the different environments. But you know, once you abstract outwards into you know, user, user groups or access to resources, it's, it starts to get a little fuzzy depending on what, um, what environment you're in. Uh, VPN and VPC, so network layer uh, security. It does exist and it's good, but it's not the same in all clouds. So in, um, like in, in OpenStack, we have a version of VPC. In, um, uh, what I really like actually about Google is that it has, they go straight to VPC and they don't actually have a traditional layer three networking model. Um, and OpenStack, we have both, and, and I'll just throw a, a little pitch there. It's actually cloud scaling that has both. But, the other one is managing security incidents. So I, I like to say that there's, there's two kinds of sysadmin. And I don't mean like guys that just walked out of like IT school and they have a, a diploma that says I'm a sysadmin and they're knocking on your door. I mean like guys that have been actually doing this actively for eight, 10 years kind of thing. And those two kinds are um, guys that have been hacked and guys that don't know they've been hacked. So. <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking at this kind of stuff, you really need to think about how quickly can you respond to a security incident. Say, you know, uh, this, is, this was actually written um, a month and a half ago or so, just before the Heartbleed thing came out. And, it, it, you know, I, I would jump up and down every now and again, I'd get excited. But I'd jump up and down and say, what if there was a security problem that affected everybody? And people would say, oh, it's nonsense. So you really have to be thinking about this kind of stuff. Like, it's, it, when you design your app, like, what happens if there's, if there's a kernel-level exploit and you need to be able to roll out new code to your entire network at once? You know, if, you have, if your entire application depends on, a, on one particular server being up all the time, good luck. You're going to have some downtime. So let's uh, talk really briefly about some of the other landmines in the list here. Um, so we got data staging and replication. This is a tricky one. Uh, uh, you could have latency and bandwidth issues is a really big problem. So as Rand, that's the thing with Randy earlier, where he deployed a thing in uh, Korea Telecom, and the, uh, the latency went up and the application went down. This is the thing. So uh, if you're trying to keep up replication between databases and multiple clouds, and you're used to that replication being able to keep up constantly, but you're trying to do live replication to another, um, to another cloud, and that replication isn't able to keep up, what happens to your application? Does it just bomb and fail? Or like, where are you going to be able to route around that problem? Um, 
Yeah. So uh, the other thing is it can get expensive really quickly since you're paying for data. Like uh, a lot of um, a lot of like web scale applications have almost as much data traveling on like back and forth on the back end as they do uh, traveling out to the world. And that gets really tricky. That gets really expensive. Uh, and you're paying for data. So uh, app messaging. In this, we're talking about queuing systems, like uh, the SQS or RabbitMQ and stuff. If you need a common one across the environment and you've invested, got it, uh, then you're going to have a rough time. You should really basically lean in early and, uh, and, and go towards well-known, well-understood, uh, open source, lowest common denominator tools like uh, uh, RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Messaging is going to have to be have to be a tool that can spread across multiple environments, and also, can you do it securely? And that's another secret sauce thing. If you haven't checked out console.io yet, you should really check out that website. It's uh, fascinating where the world's going. Uh, networking and network management, we kind of covered a little bit, um, and that's uh, you know. Well, here's a different example, like variations on Nix. Uh, in certain environments, you bring up a you bring up a VM, and it's got. Uh, uh, it's got ETH0 and it's the public access. In another one, you bring up it and it's got uh, ETH0 is the internal private network and ETH1 is the public access. In another one, you bring it up and it's got ETH0 is internal, but it has, it's natted out to public, so you can talk to both directions. If your app is architected to look for ETH0 and set it up that way, then that's going to be a headache. Uh, and again, VPC for isolation, sure, but it's different across all the environments. Same thing with HA and DR. Uh, so high availability and disaster recovery. Um, if you think about like VMware, uh, one of the ways that uh, it does high availability and uh, disaster recovery is it has, uh, uh, if, you, if you mark a VM as, as high availability and it goes down, uh, if the, the, the functional compute unit that it's sitting on goes down, then the system automatically brings that VM back up on another compute node. And if, if you know that, great. But if, if that's not what you've understood your app to do, and you're trying to build on top of it, and you're, or you're, that's what you've always known, and now you're trying to build on top of OpenStack, that's going to bite you. Um, and common tools and processes. And in this case, we're really talking about, uh, oh, well, OK, so like, uh, you don't really have a vision into your network from one spot if you're trying to do it yourself. Uh, these uh, abstraction layers, the right scales and scalers of the world, give you a view into your network that, uh, that you can use as a common sort of portal into, uh, into all of your clouds. But if you don't have that, you have um, like Horizon. Horizon's not going to show you AWS. Aurora is pretty cool, actually. Aurora is what happened when uh, PayPal rebuilt Asgard, which is Netflix's um, auto-scaling um, portal interface thing. And that works across multiple OpenStack in environments. But um, you know, you're out of luck if you want to talk to Google as well. Um, yeah, so also high-level tools with abstraction. I'm, I'm going to skip ahead here because I've got three minutes left. So summary. Your steps towards, um, towards building an application that's going to work in a hybrid environment, things you need to think about is understanding and documenting your application. Start from the ground up, understand everything about it, and write it down. Figure out where your headaches are going to be. Figure out, even if you're wrong, if it's on paper and you understand it, great. Uh, employ cloud native design, which is, as we said before, the idea of uh, you know, building ap applications that route around failure, uh, the, sort of the Netflix and Google style of, uh, of, of, of building. Uh, use well-understood open source tools. This is the uh, you know, lowest common denominator stuff, stuff with a lot of user base, um, RabbitMQ, uh, Puppet and Chef. Abstract everything, or at least to a level that you're comfortable with. Um, automate everything. And we're talking at this point about uh, basically Puppet, Chef, etc. And ensure behavioral compatibility. Also, that's not misspelled, just so you know. This is, uh, I am Canadian, so I am legally allowed to spell it that way. But what I actually mean by ensure behavioral compatibility is testing. So unit tests, Tempest tests, test everything. Test uh, the speed of your connections to the database, and don't expect them to be the same across multiple environments. And that's me with one minute and 30 seconds left. So I, I saw you standing. I, I assume that it's a question.
Amazon wallet is well developed and HP Huawei mm -hmm. is coming up with the great things that are open stack based, Sorry. which has advantages, but why would somebody really want to do hybrid? Okay, so the question was, like, why would somebody want to do hybrid in the first place? Uh, the answer to that is really, uh, it depends on the application. So, if, for instance, if you're, uh, if, 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 if you're finding that, you know, you don't have, a, say, here's a good one. Say you're a tax company. Uh, say, you know, you have uh, all of your internal environment and you've proven to yourself that OpenStack is the way to go. You've proven to yourself that you need a cloud for your internal stuff. But three months of the year, you need five times the capacity. So it makes a lot of sense for you to burst into a public cloud. It doesn't make a lot of sense for you to buy five times the capacity for the rest of the year. So every, every application is different, and every business is a unique and beautiful snowflake that has different requirements. Just to say, if people are going to be taking their own private cloud and then also bursting out, I, I definitely recommend uh, have your own OpenStack and burst into OpenStack, and that way things are more of the same. That is a, that's, that's very valid, but then I, we get I into can, uh, price questions. I can questions. assure you that that is not the case. Every OpenStack deployment is currently not very interoperable. You will actually get more compatibility between Amazon and Google, uh, which are completely different proprietary software stacks, than you will get between most OpenStack deployments. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, I think that's me uh, coming to an end. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and I appreciate your time. <laughs>